Okay, <clears throat> so we're starting with a chunk of clay. Now this chunk of clay that you're starting with, in some cases, could come out of the bin in the back of the room. That is where clay is going to live from now on. Okay, but you don't need a lot. And it's okay if somebody else has already used it. Because remember, we're starting with clean hands in here. So we should be okay. Okay, so we start with a uh, little brick of clay. And you heard on your first episode of Great Pottery Throwdown of a, a method or a process called wedging, right? That's where you roll and smash the clay on the table in order to remove air bubbles, okay? When clay is fresh, Right from the bag, it's supposed to have been de-aired at the factory. So they were supposed to use a big old vacuum and suck all of the air out of the clay so that you shouldn't have to worry about that. Now, some people say you should wedge clay no matter what, okay? I trust the factory mostly because I don't want to wedge it, if we're being honest. Okay, but it's good practice. You're going to learn how to wedge next week. For this assignment, don't worry about it. It's... The, what you're making is not important enough to worry about that whole process, okay? So we're going to start with a little brick of clay, and we're going to put this through this crazy machine called the slab roller. So I'm going to turn the camera over to here, and we're going to... Sorry, camera folks. Now we're going to prep it up. Okay, this crazy machine in the middle of the room is called the slab roller. <coughs> it's very large, very expensive. It has multiple parts to it. This top part here, this is called the canvas. The piece underneath it is just the, technically it's also canvas, that's the canvas board. When we work with this, we want clay to go underneath the top canvas, but on top of the board. Okay, it has to have something in between itself and this pin so that it doesn't stick, okay? This is a hollow steel pin, okay, and there's no give to it. So be careful on the slab roller. We also don't want it to slam into the end. In order to get it to move, you turn it the opposite direction that you think you would. Okay? And its main purpose is just flattening out clay. One thing you should notice is that I don't throw this to move it out of the way. I roll it up. Reason being is because this gets full of clay dust pretty easily, and if we just kind of fling it through the room, it sends the dust everywhere, okay? So your starting shape matters. Okay, if you want to make a slab that is a certain width and a certain length, you should consider how much clay you're using and your starting shape. So I just want a piece of clay that gives me enough for nine inches by three inches rectangle. Okay, that's what I want for this time. If I put this in there, it's gonna flatten it, okay, but I'm not positive I'm gonna get three inches wide out of this. Okay, so what I would do is I would pound this out just with my fist. And you can do this at your table. Pound this out so that it's wider to start with. Okay, does that make sense? Now, also the direction that you put it into the slab roller matters. So, if I put it in this way, and the slab roller rolls over it, I'm gonna get a long, uh, narrow piece of clay. If I put it in this way, it's gonna give me kind of a stumpy, not as long. Okay, so chances of me being able to get three, three by three squares out of this is pretty slim. So I'm gonna put it in this way, up here right next to the rolling pin, and you see how big this is, so multiple students can use this at a time. Put the canvas over the top. Make sure all fingers are clear. Okay, this would just smash, just crush your fingers. So please make sure all fingers are clear. And then you roll over the top. Make sure you roll over the last piece of clay, depending on how much is there. And then go back the other way. Please make sure it does not slam into the end. That's not a race to see who can make it go the fastest. Okay, and this 
to where we got. That makes sense? Okay, think of it like the, uh, have you seen one of those penny smasher machines? Or like Elitches or Disneyland World? Same concept. Okay, so the shape that you put in there matters. All right. We're gonna turn this back this way. Sorry, camera folks. There we go. Okay, so now we need to pay attention to one specific thing when we do the slab roller, and it's this texture. You see that texture? That needs to go away. Okay? This is a texture I would expect to see on slab projects that were made uh, in an elementary school, okay? But not in a high school. So this needs to be smoothed out. You can smooth this out either using your wooden rib, okay, or a metal rib, okay? And all you do is you drag your rib on the top across that texture to get rid of it, okay? So wooden rib works. Metal rib, use the flat side of it. Don't use the curved side of it because you can put little divots. I actually think the metal rib works better. Okay, you can also use your sponge, a damp sponge to do this. Okay, but the issue is if you add too much water to your clay, it's gonna be really hard to work with, especially slabs. Okay, so get rid of slab roller texture. Step number one. Okay, and then step number two will be actually measuring things out. Now your toolkits did not come with rulers, you'll have to borrow one. So you can either use a regular ruler or a carpenter square, your choice. This is called the carpenter square. Okay, see how it has this 90 degree angle right here? Okay, you can use that to measure these things out too. It's got inch measurements. And if I want three, three by three squares, how long should I measure this out to be? Nine inches, right? You're like, oh, Mr. T, it's only 10 o'clock. Don't make me do math. <laughs> we got to do math sometimes. Now, it's always like geometry stuff. Don't ask me to tell you what the quadratic formula is. I have no idea. Okay. That's why I like the carpenter square, is because it makes it super easy to measure out with the right angles. Okay, three and six, three and six. I'm gonna draw more lines. Okay. And then I'm ready to cut it up. So I'm using your the potter's knife for this. So I'm going to take this clay, okay, I really am only going to need a little bit of it, okay? So I'm going to take just a little bit of this and maybe even put it inside my project bag so that it doesn't dry out while I'm doing this next step. And then the rest of this should go back into the bin while it's still soft, back here in the corner of the room. So 
They're airtight bins. Please try to help remember to put the lids on. Okay. And then we have the pieces we need to start this little project. Before I go any further, I want to make sure you know there's another option for you when you're rolling out slabs, especially those of you who have to do it at home, because clearly you probably you don't have a slab roller. Okay, so rolling pins that you would use in the kitchen, those work just fine. Uh, but if you are kind of weirded out that you would have clay on something you would also make cookies with, I get that. Uh, so a dowel rod, which is just a stick. Like this. I have quite a few of these over here. Okay, but a dowel rod. Okay, and then two of these flat things on the sides of it. And it just so happens that the thickness that the slab roller makes and these flat stick things are the same. They're the same. Okay, so you would take your piece of clay, put it in between these things, and roll it out with this. Okay, you're welcome to borrow these. You just have to bring them back. Okay, so that's how you could do it at home. If you don't have access to those kinds of things at home, there is one other way to uh, roll out a slab, um, and it involves some physical effort, so there will be a different demo for that posted on Canvas later. Okay. So the goal is for these three pieces to be stuck together. You should have a base and two walls. Okay. This is what the end goal is here. But in order to get these to connect, we have to do a couple things. Some folks, when they build with slabs, they're just gonna put it directly on top, like this. Okay, but the issue is that if we put this other one over here now, we have a little bit of slab right here that hangs off because of this thickness. Okay, so it's no longer exact measurements. Same story if you build the slabs onto the sides using the table. Now we have kind of a funny corner back here here, I'll do it on this side so you can see. Kind of a funny corner right there that we would have to fill. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to do is cut 45 degree angles into two of the sides on these just for this assignment. If you were making a box, you would want to do all the sides. A couple choices. You can either use the angle cutter tool, which looks like this, or you can eyeball it just using your potter's knife. I'll show you the angle cutter tool first. Okay, so I'm going to actually have this on the table, and then this wood part actually touches your clay, and that little piece of fishing line cuts through and leaves a 45-degree angle right there. Make sense? So you would want to do that to any of the sides that you are going to be putting together. One more time. Okay. And now is where we plan. I'm going to set them out so that I know which sides of this one I should cut. So this side and this side. Now, if you don't want to use the angle cutter tool or you don't have access to one, we can eyeball it. I'm just using my potter's knife here. I'm going to hold it at what I think is a 45. Just use your best judgment. Okay, and you can cut those angles in yourself. Just be careful how flat you hold your knife. Okay, so these are all going to go together. 
Now when you add a piece of clay to another, you should always score it. Score it. Thank you. So I'm going to score every side that's going to connect. Just using my needle tool. Okay, and then you can either use water or something that's new to your tables, or the bottles that look like this. This is called slip. This is water and clay mixed together. Okay, this works a little better than water does when you put stuff together. It kind of, it's a little more sticky. Okay, so I'd recommend using this. These bottles will be cleaned, okay, so you don't have to worry about it. But it's just full of liquid clay. One thing I would recommend is anytime you use one of these bottles, put your finger over the tip like this, and then give it a gentle shake because it's natural for the clay to settle in there. So you're going to end up with all the water at the top. Okay. And then we're going to use that. Don't use very much of it though. Okay. So hold it up to your piece. Gently squeeze the bottle. Okay. And you only want to put that on one side that's going to connect. Okay. So this is going to go here, like this, <clears throat> and this one is going to go here, and then kind of set them up together. You want to do two walls at a time if you can, otherwise gravity wins, okay, and we want gravity to not win. So we're going to do two walls at a time. Think about it like having a close friend to hold you up when times get hard. Okay, and then I want you to watch right down here. Watch where my seams are. So I'm going to support, I'm going to push into the table first and then down at the base. And you can see that slip coming up through that seam, right? That means I have a good connection. Same story right here. Okay, and then I'm going to gently pinch this back part together. If you pinch it too hard, you're gonna get this shark fin looking thing on the outside, and we're trying to avoid that. Okay, so I got two of the walls up. Another good way to tell if you have a good connection is you might be able to pick the whole thing up without it coming apart. Okay, now you don't have to do that. That's just a good sign of a good connection. If you skip scoring and using water or slip, when we pick this, your slab project up to put it into the kiln, it's just going to crumble. You have to score your edges together. Have to. Okay? Otherwise, it's not going to work. Okay? Next step is we're going to take just a little bit of clay from that section that I set aside a little bit ago. And we're going to roll just a little coil. doesn't have to be pretty. Okay? And then I'm going to put this right here. Okay, and then I'm going to put some right there. And then a little bit more. Right here. So this is what's going to help seal those things even more. Um, have any of you ever done any or seen, whether you participated or not, uh, somebody install a window or a new bathtub or a new sink? Okay, so they have this tube of stuff called caulk, C-A-U-L-K, that they put into the edges and then smooth it out to help seal it, right? Same concept right here. We want these to be sealed like caulk. So I'm gonna press in, always supporting from the outside, Okay, you see how my left hand is supporting on the outside. Okay. 
okay, to get them to kind of stick a little more. And then, if you can, use your fingers to kind of smooth that clay out to your base and to the wall. I have big fingers, so I'm going to employ the use of a couple of my tools. Okay, here's your wooden knife. The sharp side probably won't do you any good, but this side has this nice kind of curved end on it. You could also use these tools. You just got these the other day, right? Okay, so I'm going to, once again, support from the outside, and I'm gonna use the curved edge of this to kind of pull the clay down into the base, and then same story, pull the clay up into the wall, and then run the curved edge all the way down to make that seal. Does that make sense? Cool. This one, same story. It can just get into skinnier places. Okay. So you can see on the outside kind of what my connection looks like here. Okay, I would just take my finger and dip that in water or in slip and just kind of gently go up the edge of it. Okay, just to kind of clean up that edge. Any questions about constructing this part? Okay, so then this brings me to your second part of the task. Okay, so you saw that so far that took me 20 minutes. And that was with explaining the slab roller and some of the other tools. Okay, so this could be done in one class period, ideally. Okay, the rest of this <coughs> you need to kind of pay attention to clay consistency for because I want you to add a texture to three, all three sides. You can do it on the inside or on the outside, but I want three different textures. There, there, and there. Or there, there, and there. Okay, your initials and the number three on the bottom, just so that I know whose is whose. Okay, but add a texture. Now, texture can be visual or it can be tangible. We are talking about tangible texture this time. Visual texture is something that technically it feels smooth, but it has a difference in plane, visually speaking. So some of the glazes that I have will have kind of a speckled look, okay? And that is a visual texture. You can't feel the speckles. You can see them though, right? Visual texture. Tangible texture, you can actually feel a difference in the plane. So in this case, Textures can be stamped in, they can be carved out, or they can be added on. So if you're adding on texture, that could be as simple as taking a little bit of clay, rolling it into a ball. Okay, and then we would score. Add a little bit of slip. Okay, and doing a bazillion of those. Take you forever? Yes. Look super awesome? Also, yes. Okay? You could also carve in texture. I don't have a carving tool up here next to me, but it's a ribbon tool in your toolbox. You know what? Let me grab one. Okay, your ribbon tool or loop tool from your toolbox is this guy where it has a rounded edge on one side and the square edge on the other one. Okay, you could carve in a texture with this.
See what I'm driving at? Okay. Now, I would very highly recommend that if you're going to carve in your texture, you wait until your clay is leather hard. Okay. The more floppy plastic it is, the harder carving is. Okay. And if you're trying to get it done in one class period, employ the help of some heat. Okay. Okay. Give it a couple minutes of heat. And then you should be able to carve to your heart's desire. Okay. Um, if you're going to stamp in texture, most of the time you want your clay to be pretty soft, okay, it's depending on the stamps. And almost anything can be used as a stamp, okay, just as long as it's not somebody else's project. So the bottom of your shoe even, your house key, jewelry that you're wearing, a pine cone, okay, there's pretty much anything can be used as a stamp. And I have a whole bucket of them over on the door side of the room underneath the glaze cabinets. There's a whole bucket of just stuff that could be used as a stamp. Okay? But my favorite stamps are my tools. Because I can create... Just by pressing a different part of the tool in... A lot of different choices. Okay, and then I'm going to flip it and use the other side. And see how that gives me a sharper point? So we have contrast there. So that's another texture. Okay. I'm going to do another one here, because remember, three sides. So I'm going to take my wooden rib, and I'm going to press this in. Okay, and then I'm going to take this. This is called the dimple tool. You can borrow these from the back of the room there. Okay, just remember to clean them off. Okay, these actually work better if your clay is a little more stiff, but that's not essential. See what I did there? Also notice how I used space. I alternated to create more movement in the piece. Okay, so the whole point of texture is to make your piece stand out above the rest. Okay, think about this. Professional possibility. You're, you have your own table and you're trying to sell mugs. Okay, you're right next to somebody else who's at their table trying to sell mugs. What makes your mugs stand out from theirs? If somebody's standing in front of both tables trying to decide which mugs they're going to do, what's going to draw your viewer, your buyer, into your product rather than theirs? And texture is one of the best ways to do that. Now, shape, obviously, and handle style, but we get into that later. Okay? But texture, if they were the exact same shape, exact same handle, how do you make yours stand out from theirs? Texture. Okay? This is not a texture, so please don't do this. Not a texture. That's a terrible drawing. Okay? Not a texture. Get it? The sun and the tree and the sideways river and the very endangered M bird. Endangered. Okay? <clears throat> so please don't draw as your texture. Please actually add something or carve something. Okay? Now, if you carved in a bird, not an M bird, Okay, but if you carved in an actual bird and you could feel the difference in plane, does that count as a texture? Heck yeah, it does. Okay, but this is not a texture. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is not, uh, it's kind of a texture and it's also kind of not a texture. Okay, it's another element of art and design. It's called negative space. 
Okay? And in order to help us understand negative space, we must employ the help of my old friend, Mr. Toilet Paper Roll. Here's Mr. Toilet Paper Roll. Okay? He has a beautiful mustache. He's been working on it for a long time. Okay? And now Mr. Toilet Paper Roll loves negative space. Okay? We say, hey, Mr. Toilet Paper Roll, today we're talking about negative space. Okay, one more time. Today we're talking about negative space. Woo! Oh, come on, you know you're going to do that when you get home. You're like, Mom, look what I learned in ceramics. She's like, what am I paying for? Education, folks. Education. So, the point of Mr. Toilet Paper Roll, negative space is a shape caused by what surrounds it. For example, what shape am I looking through? That'd be a circle, but technically there's nothing there, right? This is a circle-ish. He's been smashed a lot of times. But there's nothing there. So negative space is a shape caused by what is surrounding it. Negative space actually happens a lot more often than you think. For example, do you see rectangles on this laundry basket? So here's an example of it in ceramics lines. Okay? Using negative space to create a pattern by poking holes. You could cut out organic holes. They don't have to be geometric shape. Okay? But negative space could be an option here if you would like. So either use your potter's knife to cut through and make your own holes, or if you'd like to borrow this called a hole punch, you could do that too, but you want your clay to be leather hard when you do this, okay? Because otherwise it just kind of smashes. But the way you go about it is you support from the outside, or the inside in this case. I'm going to poke through, and I'm going to twist it. And then when I pull it back out, I keep twisting it. Okay, now you see how floppy my wall is? So if it was leather hard, it would be way easier, and you would avoid this on the inside. See that kind of inward tear shape that it makes? That doesn't happen if your clay's leather hard. Okay? So that is another option for decoration if you want to. But you have to have three different textures on three different sides. Your initials on the bottom and the period number. Okay? Are there any questions about this project? This is what you're making for this project. Super simple. It's kind of pointless in terms of like, I guess you could put a sponge in there. It's a sponge holder. Or a ring holder. I don't know. Okay? But the whole point is that I'm seeing how you build the slats. Okay? You would turn in two pictures of this. One picture... So I could see your textures. If that was the outside, it would be probably three pictures so that I could see both textures and then wherever you put the third one, probably on the inside. Okay, and then your initials on the number on the bottom. Turn that in. If you would like to keep it for whatever reason, that's totally fine. I don't expect a lot of you will want to keep it. So in that case, you could squash it, and then we could reuse this clay. Any questions? Fantastic.